All right, good morning. I want to welcome you here this morning. I want to welcome those who are first-time visitors with us. Glad that you're here this morning. And uh, you'll notice on our back table we have a uh, visitor card to fill out. And if uh, you'd like to fill that out, I have a rector visit this morning. I uh, have a few announcements this morning. Uh, first of all, um, we do have the YouTube link uh, for the services. And so there are those who are joining us here. And, uh, even one downtown, a couple downtown, right, ran the Army Navy 10 mile today. So that's fantastic. Never had an urge to do that, but I mean, you know. <laughs> uh, we'll be doing a new members class in baptism in the near future. So uh, we'll let you know the date. If you haven't joined a church, like to, or, or interested in baptism, we have uh, forms to fill out. Um, also, so we have to get together, get the right, right timing for that. Uh, if you have an interest in being a member of the missions committee, we're reconstituting the missions committee. Uh, please see me. Uh, business meeting is fast approaching. That's November the 10th. If you uh, have any reports to turn into Adriana, she'd like it today. <laughs> Written reports to put into the annual report. And so uh, see Adriana. I don't know if Adriana gives waivers or not. As long as I have it on the oh, okay. <laughs> See, that's great. See, that's great. So, <laughs> all right. And so that the business meeting be uh, after we have a thanks uh, giving uh, lunch on the tenth of November, and then we'll have the business meeting. And so, uh, just see that a nomination forms uh, for. Uh, the office is on the back table uh, for offices. Uh, we have deacons, of course, uh, treasurer, and uh, church clerk. And so take note of that. Holiday rummage sale, flea market, whatever you want to call it, November the 16th uh, to get rid of your treasures. And so see Gail for information on that. Uh, board members, uh, we have a board meeting this coming uh, uh, Friday, uh, 6 o'clock. Uh, dinner provided. Agendas will be in your box. Uh, the second meeting, uh, the Bible study, they're working through the book, Let Women Be Women, be Saturday the 18th at 10 a.m. Our missions update, world missions update, uh, Teams for Medical Missions. Uh, this comes out of their October Vital Signs newsletter. Uh, John spent the entire issue of the, this newsletter, October edition, of Vital Signs recruiting team members for trips to Jamaica. He emphasized no one is too old. He showed a picture of an 87-year-old woman went to Jamaica. She's been doing it for years. So, I mean, that, that's pretty good, you know. So, uh, so I said, no one's too old. Uh, to take, make a trip, no one's too busy, too poor, or not skilled enough. <laughs> uh, each quarterly team, they, have, they, they send teams to Jamaica in February and in May and in uh, August and November. And so each team has 16 to 20 team members with skills of help. They do building, they doctors, pharmacists, clerical, uh, sports, uh, teachers, evangelists, so they have room for every type of you know, skill to go down to Jamaica. Uh, Messiah College has been sending uh, several teams down. In addition to uh, normally recruiting teams for churches, Messiah College has been helping. Uh, they, they particularly been helping with the sports teams, things like that. Uh, when they have a doctor show up, the doctor is able to go to shut-ins, you know, and so that's a tremendous ministry. Uh, recruitment is ongoing, an ongoing task, and the right mix of team members is important care in the ministry. In a final note, remember the last time we had an update from them uh, in September, uh, they needed $36,000 to close a ministry gap, and of course uh, they're short about 3000 a month in income. 
they got $95,000 in. Isn't that great? So they needed 36,000, they got $95,000 in, so they're praising the Lord for that and keep up the good work and good ministry there, okay? Doug? Good morning again. Okay, today's reading is from the book of Romans, starting in chapter 7, starting in verse 13. Okay. Has then what is good become death to me? Certainly not. But sin, that it might appear sin, was producing death in me through what was good. So that sin through the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. If then, I do what I do not to do, I agree with the law that is good. But now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but now to perform what is good I do not find. For the good that I will to do, I do, I do not do. But the evil I do not do, I practice. Now if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. Let's pray. Dearly Father, we're thankful for this, another day we have together together to come together and worship you in song and the message that Pastor will bring. Bless him as he preaches this morning with the message. Also, through this message, in scripture that I just read, help us not to do the things we're not supposed to do and to do the things we need to do. Just be with us and bless us and we'll give you the glory and the grace. We, and we'll ask for your grace as we try to do these things. And we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we continue our study in the book of James. James chapter 4 is one of the most important passages on prayer in the scriptures. And it kind of gives us a, a uh, guideline. And James chapter 4, verses 1 through 5, is a culmination of what James has been talking about. Uh, and the fact that... Uh, you say you have faith, but, uh, you know, you demonstrate a lack of wisdom. You're carried away by your own lust. You are, uh, you end up uh, showing, speaking in anger, but not listening. You end up uh, showing partiality. You end up showing, uh, you talk about your faith, but there's no works behind it. Faith without works is dead. Uh, your tongue is a what? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a, a, a flaming fire that, that kindles, and out of the same mouth comes blessing and cursing. And so this is all leading up to this, and this is a continuation of the conclusion that we talked about last week, where he said, listen, don't you know that the things of this world are, you know, are, are essential and they're demonic and they're fleshly, but the things above are holy and righteous and peaceful. And so he, he comes to a conclusion of a choice. And this, by the way, is always through scriptures, right? You have a choice between serving yourself or serving the Lord. You have a choice. So you can't do both. I mean, Elijah mentioned the same thing. He said, listen, Choose you this day who you're going to serve. If God's God served him, but if Bell's God served him. So do this. That's the problem Cain had in Genesis chapter 4. Cain's 
offer was rejected. Abel's was accepted. Cain's was rejected because he came with the wrong attitude. He came with a selfish attitude. He gave God some of the fruit, not the best of the fruit. And he just thought, well, you know, this should be good enough. (laughs) And God rejected the thing. Listen, that's the same thing with us. If we give God only the second best or our leftovers, it's not acceptable. We're to, uh, we are to uh, worship God with our what? Heart, mind, and soul, right? It's a complete thing. It's a total thing. And so James picks up this thought here in James chapter 4 and verse 1. He says, where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure, that war in your members? You lust and do not have, you murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss, that you may spend it on your pleasures. Adulterers and adulteresses, Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scriptures say in vain that the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously? Matter of fact, James had already made this conclusion back in the first chapter. A double-minded man is what? unstable in all his ways. He said you can't serve God and man at the same time. You can't do it. Now, you have conflict within and conflict without here. James continues the thought from chapter 3 that the wisdom of the world is earthly, it's sensual, it's demonic. Now, he's, now, as I mentioned last week, it doesn't mean you're demon-possessed. It means, in fact, you're on the side of the demons if you agree with them as far as what your priorities are, right? That's what we're talking about. And so there's conflicts. He says, now, now, I want you to notice this. He emphasizes at the very beginning of this passage that if you are pursuing earthly things, it's going to be conflicts with your brothers and sisters, right? It's going to be conflicts in the church because other people are pursuing their own things too, and that's where he said, where they come from? Well, this whole concept is the fact that there's this strife within you, therefore it's going to be strife within the body of Christ. Now, literally, the Greek says wars and battles, which makes sense because it's a military concept. He said, where, he used a military term, said, where are these battles within the church come from? Now, we can stop here for just a second, and it's not a hypothetical thing. James is hearing back from these churches that there are battles, <laughs> that this shouldn't be. Because one of the things the church has to be is the example of what Christ should be, right? The, you know, Jesus made that in this very comment in John chapter 13. He says, they'll know you're my disciples if you have what? Love for one another. They'll know that there should be a difference. Now, these battles are like those that the unsaved are doing. He says, you're acting just like the unsaved, which ruins your testimony. It's just like what happened in the Corinthians. He, you know, he said, listen, don't I... Paul said, don't I call you carnal? Isn't that not true? (laughs) You're acting just like the world. Matter of fact, one of the most intriguing passages to me in 1 Corinthians is the fact there's a lot more I have to tell you. I just don't have time to say all of it. So all the things he said in 1 Corinthians, all the things he said in 2 Corinthians, there was still a lot more that he had to deal with. And he said he's going to deal with when he sees them face to face. The Galatians, how soon have you left the gospel that I've left you? If me or an angel from heaven come down and give you a different gospel, let him be anathema, let him be accursed. Uh, the t- two women uh, in, in Philippians, in Philippians chapter 4, were fighting. He says, my fellow yoke fellow, just help these two women. Uh, one, one commentary called uh, Odious and Soon Touchy. <laughs> and so, you know, Odious and Syntyche. And so, 
Uh, so this conflicts in the body of Christ. Now the conflicts are enumerated by John's as being carried away by your own lust, as your own favoritism, as not helping a brother in need, uh, or not a corrupt, corrupt speech. He says, don't you know uh, pure and defiled religion is to visit the widow and orphan in their needs? Don't you know that's what it is? Now James states that these conflicts come from selfish desires within us and each believer to fulfill our own pleasure. Now the Greek word pleasure here is the word hedonon. We get our word hedonism from. This is where the word comes from. That your your own lust and your own longings and I want this and I want that. As a matter of fact, I always thought after Ecclesiastes was written, no one would want to pursue riches again because Solomon concluded it was all what? It's all vanity, right? 28 times he uses that term in Ecclesiastes in 12 chapters. And so I tried it all. I tested it all out. Riches, I had riches. I mean, women, he had women. Uh, <laughs> lots of women. Uh, power, right? Glory, he had it all. He said, then his life came what? To an end. Said, that's it? You know? It's all over. And so he said, hedonism, the, the lust and longings, and this is where it comes from. Proclaiming Christ while seeking our own lust. Now James illustrates this point by demonstrating that our <laughs> their prayers were selfish and carnal. He said, you're praying to God instead of expressing gratitude, which in Philippians 4, you know, 5 and 6 are talking about, gratitude and, and, and praying for needs and interceding for others. You're praying for selfish things. You know, dear Lord, I really could use a Mercedes. <laughs> Maybe a two or three year old one or something, you know, just, he said, you're praying for selfish things, selfish desires. And he lists two of these errors here. He says, they do not ask God to meet their needs at all. They're not praying. Quite often, what we try to do in our lives is figure things out first, and then we get desperate, then we pray. <laughs> So we got, we got this covered, Lord. I mean, you had that with Joshua, right? You know, after the battle of Jericho, it was a great city, and it fell. Ai was such a small city. He said, I don't have to pray about that. You know, God, I got it covered. Well, I didn't have it covered. Because there was what? Sin in the camp. You know, Achan had taken of the accursed thing. Uh, same thing, he didn't learn his lesson. It comes to the Gibeonites, they... Pretend they came from a far country, remember, and they had this shabby clothes, and they had this moldy bread, and, and uh, the torn and, and decayed wine bottle and stuff. So, oh, okay, we could, I don't have to, and by the way, I, uh, that, that passage is very important, what it says there in the sixth chapter there, he says, and they did not check with the mouth of the Lord. Boy, listen, in this life, there are no small things. <laughs> there are hidden things that we don't know about, you don't know something that might seem minor ends up being pretty major. So we have to be very, very careful. And so we do not ask, first of all. Secondly, when we ask, we ask amiss that we might fulfill it on our own lust. We pray selfishly. Um, there's things that I call solution prayers. And the solution prayers are. I pray what my need is, and then I tell God how I want him to solve it, right? <laughs> you know, uh, one preacher put it this way, we write a contract and expect God to sign it. <laughs> but God, do you agree with me and everything else? If you just send this amount of money and everything else, and by the way, I need it by Thursday. Um, no. We put our request before the Lord. The Lord will answer in his own time and his own Way. And so James is teaching us here that we're either not praying for those things we need or we're not praying correctly. We're praying for selfish things. And he says neither one of these is going to be successful before the Lord. Remember in the Lord's Prayer, whose will to be done? 
thy will to be done, right, on earth as it is in heaven. You know, it might be a secret to some. We are his servants, he's not ours. <laughs> he's not the magic, magic genie in the sky, okay? See, covetousness is a violation of the 10th commandment. You shall not cover your neighbor's wife or anything, your neighbor's, you know, if we pray covetous prayers, we're praying selfish prayers, they're not actually true prayers. All right, matter of fact, the Lord instructed, and we don't quite often take this to heart, in Matthew 6, he says, having food and raiment, what? Be content. Well, yeah, I like food and raiment and a car and a nice house and, well, you know, the Lord provides a lot more than what we actually need to live. I mean, how many in here are going to go home and they say, I wonder what I'm going to eat today? Well, you might say that not because your coverage bare, but because you have so many choices <laughs> that you can do that. The Lord's provided abundantly. And so the Lord says we have to learn to be content. To be carnally focused in our prayer is to pray counter to the will of God. It says you do not have because you're not seeking the Lord's will. And so if we keep bugging God, he might give you what you want. It says it over in Psalm 106, 15, he says, he said, I'll give you the desires of your heart, but I'll send leanness to your soul. That's what he did with Solomon. Solomon thought he'd be satisfied with a little bit more. Solomon's been, uh, you know, another palace and, uh, you know, maybe more gold and uh, more women. Didn't work. You know, because those things don't satisfy. He makes sure that if you pursue the things of the world, it's not going to satisfy you. Because only the Lord can satisfy you. Only the Lord can feel that desire in your heart. Okay? And so, we have to come to a point and understand that if we seek our own fleshly desires, not only does it not satisfy, it causes conflict in the church because now you have covetousness, now you have rivalry. God's work cannot be done through fleshly means. It's a spiritual work done with his leading, not with our conniving. Now, notice what he said. This is very strong language. You adulterers and adulteresses. Now, what does that mean? Well, the church is the bride of Christ. And if we pursue other things, then we're actually committing adultery against the relationship and covenant we have with the Lord. That's what he's talking about. He says, if you're a double-minded man, if your eyes are wandering somewhere else, if your desires, your goals, your values are somewhere else, you are going away from the Lord. He said, you adulterers and adulteresses. So to seek anything other than the Lord's will makes us friends of the world and enemies to God. By the way, the world here is not... Uh, Deo Geo, which is sometimes used, but it's also the word, the word cosmos. The Greek word cosmos does not mean universe. <laughs> That's what we use it for. It means ornaments. Stars are God's what? Ornaments. It comes over into the English language as cosmetics. That you put ornaments on your face. I won't go down that road any further than that. You know, the ornamentation. He says, if we love the ornamentations of the world, the things the world has to offer, then we are enemies to God. And so, you see, salvation is not only coming to the Lord to have eternal life. It's a, it's a whole life relationship. 
You notice over in the Great Commission in Matthew 28, it does not say there to make converts. It says to make what? Make disciples. In other words, we, when you come to Christ, you are to be a follower of Christ. You are to learn about Christ. You are to submit to Christ and you are to seek his will, not your own. And so, so we come here that we're not to seek the word. And by the way, you can't do both. You can't serve two masters. You'll love the one and you'll hate the other. Uh, so as brides of Christ, we're going to be faithful to Christ. A great illustration of that, of course, is the book of Hosea. Um, I always thought God was pretty tough on his prophets. Hosea, I want you to marry a prostitute. Oh, whoopee. You know, and he marries Gomer. And he goes, you know, and it has all this trouble. And he keeps doing what? He keeps going after, right, to get her back and to get her back. And after all, her lovers use her up. And he has that interesting statement in, in the book where he says, you know, prostitutes get paid by their lovers, but you're paying your lovers. I thought, well, that's a weird thing. You know, after you, then he brings her back and he treats her as if she was a, a pure virgin. And that's what God pursuing Israel was. And that's what God pursues you when you drift away. He wants to bring you back. God so loved the world. He gave his only begotten son. Whosoever believes in him not, should not perish but everlasting life. And so we have this bride of Christ aspect. And then the passage dug ahead. You read over here in Romans chapter 7. You know, Paul says he knows it's difficult. He says, those things I want to do, I end up not doing those. And those things I don't want to do, I end up doing those. Who shall deliver me from this body of death? And the whole concept is the fact that this sin is still in us. I always thought it would have been nice once you came to Christ. They took that desires away and all the temptations away and everything. And now we're good at didn't work that way because <laughs> we still have a battle because we still have the flesh we still are in the world we still have the forces of darkness arrayed against us but here we must be aware of that sinful nature we must rebuke it you know going all the way back to Genesis 4 where Cain is told listen why is your countenance fallen in other words why are you upset if you do well, will you not be accepted? If not, sin is lying at the door, but what does it say? You must master it. Now, when the scriptures say you must master, we must realize we must make the choice. The Lord will help you, right? Without me, you can do what? You can do nothing. So he will help us in that, but we have to make the choice. He will not choose for you. You know, and that's why you have all those passages dealing with that. You have the passage which says, be you not drunk, uh, where is the excess, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Commandment to us. Put off the old man and put on the new. You know, and, and so we need to understand that you have to make it. He'll help you. The Spirit's there to help you. And so... So we come to the point realizing that we have a choice to make and there's a battle in us. And it's a serious offense to be unfaithful to the Lord. Remember the Jews were syncretists, which meant the fact they wanted to serve God and serve the idols too. But our God is a what? He's a jealous God. You know, he will not have any competing deities. And so we come to the point where, you know, where... Elijah said, look, choose you this day who you're going to serve. You're going to serve God, serve him. If you're going to serve Baal, serve him. You can't do both. God will not accept that. So we need to, re listen, we need to reject everything that hinders our spiritual walk. And it might be, you know, cravings. It might be habits. It might be addictions. 
It might be bad influence from people you're around. Whatever that is, but all that, all of these temptations are from within. If somebody, if somebody would tempt you to something that you're not tempted by, it's not effective. Satan knows what tempts us, <laughs> knows where we are. You know, I always use illustration of Brussels sprouts. If someone tempted me to eat a plate full of Brussels sprouts, it's really not very tempting to me. I remember I said that one time and someone came up after me, I like Brussels sprouts. I said, well, that, was, that wasn't the point. I mean, <laughs> I had a cousin, uh, you know, my wife was telling him about eating healthier. He didn't eat very healthy. And he said this, he said, well, if broccoli tastes like chocolate cake, I'd eat a whole plate full. <laughs> Doesn't work that way. We've got to reject those things that tempt us, that lead us away from the Lord, and receive Christ. And by the way, you'll find joy in doing that. You'll find that that will be your joy. And compared with other things you are pursuing, it's just so much better, it's so much satisfying, because you, you now have purpose, and you now have uh, something of value something worthwhile. You, know, you would like to lay your head at night on the pillow and say, today I did something worthwhile, right? Something that, that had value. Something that was, will have eternity written on it. And so we come here saying that the fact that we need to reject those things which hinder our holiness and our walk. That's why, by the way, that's why Paul said, all things are permissible to me. Now he meant all things that weren't sinful. But not all things are beneficial. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be mastered by any of it. In other words, there's a lot of things you can do, but are just the distractions to doing what you should be doing. And so you have to be careful to zero in on those things which have purpose and value. Uh, believers do not realize that being carnal makes us enemies to God. We don't focus on that. And I'm going to zero in as we come to a conclusion in there. James mentions five steps in this process of pursuing things that aren't godly. Number one, he says, we have uncontrolled carnal desires. You know, James 1.15, you're carried away by your own what? You know, your own lust, your own cravings, your own desires. Two, we beseech God to give us our desires. <laughs> uh, you know, give me this day our daily gold, you know. <laughs> Number three, our desires cause conflict within the body of Christ as we seek to get our own way. Number four, we become enemies of God in the process. And number five, God refuses to answer our prayers and he opposes us with discipline and emptiness when we oppose him. Now, God is a jealous God. You know, if, and by the way, you might not realize this, but anything that you do or anything you're pursuing that takes you away from God is an idol. You have to realize that. It might be something good. It might not be in itself wrong, but it's, it's obsessive and it's taking you away from the Word of God. It's taking you away from serving God. It's taking you away from praying. Then you don't need it. It's distracting and beneficial, you know. If you come to the end of your life and said, I spent my whole life on this hobby of mine, that's not going to be very satisfying. You know, I better be careful here, but um, <laughs> you know, when you get to him and stand before God, he's not going to ask you what level of candy crush you got to, <laughs> or, or Tetris or whatever else they're doing. He's not going to ask now it's all. Yeah, diversions are all right in their own place. 
But what's your real focus? What's your real love? Now, it states here, and this is important to understand, as the spirit yearns within us, We have to realize if you are a born-again believer, you love the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit dwells in you. And if we're doing things that grieve the Spirit, Ephesians 4.30, that he's yearning to bring us back. He won't force you, but he's yearning to lead you. He's learning, yearning to teach you. The Spirit jealously yearns within us. And if we're carnal, we are suppressing the control and the influence of the Holy Spirit. It's kind of interesting. In the New Testament, you have three things that says that the Holy Spirit and our action within us will be involved in. Number one, you'll be filled with the Holy Spirit. And by the way, that's a moment by moment. Number two, you can grieve the Holy Spirit. And number three, you can quench the Holy Spirit. First Thessalonians 5, and somebody else, you can quench the Holy Spirit. Let me end by saying this. Over in Jericho, this, this verse always struck out, stuck out to me in Jeremiah. Jeremiah 6, 15 says, my people have forgotten how to blush. My people have forgotten how to blush. What does it mean by that? It means we're not embarrassed by doing this. We're not embarrassed by not serving the Lord. We're not embarrassed by being led away from the Lord. We should be. There should, we, there should be such a conscience within us that when the Holy Spirit just whispers, what he wants or whispers we're doing something wrong, we should blush. When we, you got that four levels of conscience, remember. When we go through the conscience, going from the good or clear conscience to a seared conscience to a dull conscience to an evil conscience, we're no longer listening. We need to stay right there with a good conscience. And all the Holy Spirit has to say is, just a whisper, and we're there. We need to learn how to blush when we're not doing what we're supposed to be doing. When you pray, three things I'll leave you with. Number one, don't pray selfish prayers. <laughs> Number two, pray with thanksgiving and Praise of God. And number three, make intercession for God's will be done and not mine. And then the power of God's people will be seen. And the light will shine forth. Because no one should want to be an enemy of God. Amen. Let's pray. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you, Lord, for this tremendous passage in James 4 that we want to be those people who are praying correctly. We want to be those people who are friends of God, not enemies of God. We want to be those people who listen to the Holy Spirit who yearns jealously for us. Lord, we just pray, Lord, as we come to a conclusion here, Lord, your name be honored in our lives and that we'll seek to be able to serve you all the days of our lives for your glory. And if there's anyone that's here that or listening online that does not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, this will be the day of salvation for them. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Gospel outline, a little illustration. And we have a little diagram up here. Three points. This man represents everyone, all sin and come short of the glory of God. Therefore, he cannot enter heaven because it says that evil can't dwell with God. And so this unsaved person ends up in this lake of fire, Revelation 20. But God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And that bridge is pretty across there. 
It's Jesus Christ who is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by him. If you never come to Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, today would be a great day to do so. Amen.